knowing, verifying where to run. So the things we are going to talk about today include a quick overview of confidential computing, what this is about, uh, talking about what is attestation, talking about various use cases for confidential computing, who knows what the picture on the right is. What, only one hand? Are you kidding? It's a hacker thing. Oh, yeah. uh, going from root of trust to actual trust, uh, various platform specific details, and supporting technologies, and this one is harder to find as a picture. Any idea? Someone who was not at KVM4. So these are the foundations for the Eiffel Tower. So this is really, I'm going to talk relatively fast and brush over a number of topics because this uh, is really a summary of a blog, a series of blogs that is on the Red Hat blog, so you can scan that QR code or uh, watch later uh, on the website and you'll find links with more details. So what is confidential computing? Conti confidential computing is mostly about protecting data in use. Um, and there's, there's this quote from a guy named Kevin Mitnick, maybe you heard about him, saying, I compromise the confidentiality of that proprietary software to advance my agenda of becoming the best at breaking through the lock. Hackers typically try to do that. And the problem with infrastructure, as we shall see, is that your infrastructure today is where you run uh, your stuff. We saw that in the keynote today. But why should your infrastructure see your data? Your software now runs on someone else's computer, also known as the cloud. So you have some sort of virtual machine host, for instance, and then it has various resources that it's going to provide for you, like your CPU, memory, uh, disks, networking, and so on. And these resources are used to run various workloads, so typically that could be containers that will run inside your host. Now there are various sandboxing technologies and they are essentially designed to make sure that your containers cannot escape to the host, cannot damage it, cannot do whatever they want with the resources. They are not really designed for the other way around, uh, for someone on the host peeking inside your workload, <coughs> inside your container, etc. And so that means that if you want to run competitors on the same machine, they will typ typically be unhappy because they are not sure that some rogue admin was not paid by the other guy to peek into their data. So we have some technologies that have been established for a long time for disk encryption, network encryption. Uh, you're familiar with those. And uh, what is really missing is that what is in your memory is essentially an open secret to a host admin. So they can read that. And uh, it's maybe you feel it's secret because it's in memory, but it's really, again, an open secret. So what if we added some memory encryption to product against that? And the memory encryption doesn't need to be super strong, uh, but it has to be something that happens all the time for all the data that go to memory. And then later, uh, there were some technologies that were added to protect the integrity of the, the CPU state, because if you run that in a virtual machine, you don't want the, your virtual machine to be able to change the register state to jump anywhere in the code or, or stuff like that. And finally, and that's going to be most of the talk, uh, you need to make sure that what you run is exactly what you want to run. So attestation is there to prove that what you are running is running on the right context, in the right environment, and that uh, you are running what you think you are running. Oh, you want me to talk in the mic? Okay, sorry. Um, so first, let's start with rule of trust. So you're probably familiar with something like a TPM, so for instance, and that's that's the root of trust that measures and launches the next step. And then again and again, until you reach typically your workload. And so each step there will, as it goes, measure itself and record that in some physical device that is going to uh, have a hardware enforced recall of what happened. So this leads to the idea of trust domains. And, um, in the case of confidential containers, which is illustrated here, you have a number of things. Okay, so a lot of stuff is misaligned there. What is the resolution of this screen? Uh, I think we could, um, minus 400. So let me just force it that way. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the 
Um, you have a number of, of security domains that you need to consider. The first is, is the trusted platform, which offers a number of uh, security guarantees that are essentially enforced by hardware cryptography. Um, and so the platform will just give you these guarantees, but it doesn't really know what data is in there. And then you have the host, which will, which will provide things like resources, like physical uh, memory uh, devices, and so on. And again, the idea is that they just provide the resources, but they don't have access to what's inside because the data is encrypted all the way. And finally, you have the tenant or owner, which is all the stuff that you care about. And it's not just running on this piece of infrastructure. You see on the right something called the relying party. So that's typically, that could be something that could be on-premise for you or something in a place you trust, maybe another enclosure. Uh, and that's where you're going to do things like verifying what you are running in your trusted system. So what kind of guarantees does, does uh, confidential computing really provide? Well, the thing that we really care about, as the name implies, is confidentiality. So uh, what this means is that we will protect data in use from leaks, from tampering, from things like that. However, we will not protect against crashes. As a matter of fact, we might make them more frequent because there are cases where we'll just say stop. We won't go there. We cannot protect disk or network data. That's really your uh, role to do that. And there is no kind of guarantee of service. And again, there is a more, an increased risk of not having any kind of forward progress. And finally, it's all hardware-based cryptography, typically for memory and so on. So that's uh, something that, with sufficient effort, if you have NSA-level uh, access to the system, then maybe you can actually decrypt stuff. More importantly, it's really highly implementation dependent. What you see on the right is a chart that is just for AMD generations. So different generations will give you different level of protection. So the bottom line is you don't get automatic security out of this, right? And the next question is how fast was this car driving? So what is attestation? It's essentially proving what you run, uh, that, that you run what you want to run, exactly, and where you want to run it, specifically in a confidential environment. So let's start with a little bit of terminology with the RATS model that the IETF has established for us. So you have a component called the verifier. The verifier is really in charge of, of checking your policies. And this starts by an endorsement process where an endorser is going to say, for instance, this hardware, I put some trust in this hardware for this or that reason, for instance, because I built it. Then you have reference values providers that are going to provide to the verifier various reference values, like for instance, uh, this is the list of, the, of hashes for the software that I accept to run. So I've measured my software ahead of time and I know that this software can run there and the reference value provider hosts that. And finally, a verifier owner is going to have various appraisal policies that it can put in the verifier um, that are going to say this evidence is accepted, this evidence is not accepted. So for instance, while we develop confidential containers, we have this appraisal policy, which is anything goes because we are developing it, and so we just accept the workload to run, essentially, disk-based or whatever. And then you have an attester, so that's the thing that will try to prove who they are, um, that is going to send some evidence to the verifier that goes through these various steps. And then the result of this attestation process go to a relying party that could be used, for instance, based on other appraisal policies, this time uh, set up by the relying party owner, and that could decide, for instance, to release some secrets or do something like that. So the basic concept, again, is that you're offering some proof about the configuration of a system. In general, generally speaking, attestation is really proving some kind of property. In our ca case, what interests us is, is this system actually running with encrypted memory on, with the right firmware, with these kind of properties? Uh, for those of you who saw Vitaly's uh, talk just before this one, uh, he was mentioning some of the properties that are verifying. Now, one important kind of attestation, attestation is remote attestation, and that's when you decouple the evidence from its verification. And you all know that when you have a lock and you give the key to, let's say, your girlfriend, and then you no longer trust the girlfriend, so you change the lock, and you've decoupled the two, right? <laughs> 
just random example. So there are two big models for verifying this evidence. Um, the first one is passport check model, where you present the evidence. It's exactly what happens with a, when you present your passport uh, at the airport. So the attester is going to send its evidence, like who am I, etc., to the verifier. The verifier then issues some kind of ID, and you present this ID to the relying party. So in a cloud, typically, that would be uh, some sort of secret internal to the cloud that, that you're going to present each time you want to use an API in the cloud. Another model is the background check model, uh, which is closer to what you do with uh, biographic uh, measurements, where the attester presents the evidence directly to the relying party, and the relying party presents a variation of this evidence to the verifier, and the verifier says, yeah, this guy can go through. So, in order to try to compare various ways to analyze evidence and uh, do an attestation, um, I suggest we use a, a relatively simple pipeline that I call Remits uh, just to model the, the chains of trust. So the R stands for root of trust. That's typically certificates or hardware, chain, uh, hardware uh, components. The E is for endorsement. So typically you'd have a signing key that is issued by and va va validated through the certificate. Then the M is for measurements. That's typically in the case of a TPM, that's hashes of the data that you're looking through. So you, you, you decide to run some kind of bootloader. You measure this bootloader, you hash that, and that's what is recorded in your TPM. I is for identity. That's, uh, for instance, a reference value that you would pass to your uh, verifier. T is for trust, that all the aspects related to policies, I decide to accept this evidence or not. And ultimately, what you get out of that typically is secrets. So this could be passwords, this could be decryption keys, and so on. So let's uh, uh, see a couple of examples to understand how this works. So if you see Secure Boots, the root of trust is the TPM. Uh, the endorser is the manufacturer of the, t uh, the, the, the device. The, what you would measure typically would be something like firmware or bootloader or stuff like that. What you get out of that, uh, um, so in terms of what identifies your device is some kind of signed attestation. In, whether you trust that or not is then defined by the policy that you have in your system. You can decide to boot without secure boot at all if you want. <coughs> And typically, the secrets that you get out of something uh, of this would be, so Vitaly was, uh, was explaining how, in his case, you would get a disk, key, uh, disk encryption key that you can only get out of the TPM at this specific step, but you can get other cloud API secrets and so on. Now, to get to something maybe a little more familiar, when you go through selling a property, you have these same steps, except it's a notary that has signed records, and there's a deal of a, or affidavit that measures what you're uh, talking about. Uh, you get a property description and uh, the, the trust policy is do I give money based on what I know or not? And the secret is you get the keys of the house. And it's really the basis for historical basis for money as well in the sense that gold or silver is really the root of trust. Ultimately, at least initially, that was supposed to be what the banknotes were representing. The person the entity endorsing uh, this root of trust is a government that has some of this gold somewhere in the bank, in the uh, banks. Uh, the market value is what you measure for, you know, how much you have in terms of money and so on, which is, in terms of identity, it's identified by the number you see, for instance, of, on the bank notes. Handing over cash is how you accept the policy or not. You know, I want to buy this. Well, then I hand over cash, and I'm happy with that. And of course, the secret you get in that, in that case is the secret recipe of uh, grandma that is, tastes so good and they sell you for money. So the attestation, again, in, the, in our case, will be what you measure, and, and you do that using cryptography. So the same three domains we had before. Now, uh, there are multiple ways to do that. So for instance, AMD with a CV started with something called pre-attestation. And what pre-attestation pre does is essentially measure some specific components and, uh, and you measure your payload before you even start running it. And so the hypervisor decides, you know, uh, it, it does some operation and then you decide, I launch that or I do not. And I'm going to have a talk later today 
where I show you in practice how this works. Um, post attestation is slightly smarter. You can automate things better uh, because you can essentially measure from the guest itself and get the measurements for your own identity that you can that then transmit over the network, for instance, to the relying party or whatever. And um, ultimately, you, you probably care most about the workload. So at some point, there will be some kind of workload at the session, though very often the mechanisms for that are not very different from what you use today, like uh, having, uh, you know, saying this specific container hash is what I, I trust, etc. So now confidential computing is a relatively large field, and there are ma many ways to deploy it and use it. Uh, various use cases, uh, essentially going from virtual machines to complete clusters. So the base technology is, in general, today based on virtual machines. There are some confidential computing technologies like SGX or SME that are based uh, are at the process level, but the ones that really interest us are based on, on virtual machines. So from that, you can build functions that boot very fast, etc. and uh, the best example of this today is something called Keron VM uh, or confidential workloads. So you essentially boot something very fast and you do one thing and then you exit. Um, now, if you want to orchestrate or on a larger level, then you need to integrate that within an ecosystem like Kubernetes, OpenShift, etc. And that's the purpose of something like confidential containers. So in that case, you will use confidential machines as a runtime for your, uh, for your containers, and you'll be able to deploy your containers the usual way and do all the scaling and all the, the, the things you're used to. And the whole enchilada is if you decide to put the whole cluster inside virtual machines. So in that case, even the control plane itself is in continental virtual machines, and you have to be very, very rich to do that. So, uh, the base technology behind it all is confidential virtual machine, and if you're curious uh, about the picture on the top right, that's what you get from DuckDuckGo, at, uh, at least that's what I got last week when I searched confidential virtual machine, and I have absolutely no idea what this is. <laughs> it's confidential even to me. <laughs> so, uh, first you need to have new hardware and firmware binary interfaces uh, that expose the new features. This is highly hardware dependent at the moment. The host kernel is no longer trusted. However, it has to expose these new features. So you trust it to the extent that you can access something, but the real trust will be in the cryptographic uh, operations that happen. Same thing with the hypervisor. The hypervisor needs to expose new features. It needs to know new ways to do IOs, new ways to expose measurements, and so on. But it is not trusted, uh, even if it does that. So where the boundary of trust happens is when inside the VM, so the VM becomes the confidential enclave that you are starting to trust. And inside there, you have a guest firmware and a boot sequence that is typically measured, as well as a guest kernel, same thing, you want to measure that and make sure that you know what you're running. So uh, I mentioned confidential workloads for uh, things like uh, very simple, functions. So what you see here is a Keron VM in action, in that case on this specific laptop. That's not the confidential version that you're seeing here. But you see that you, th this is really the real-time operation. Um, so the way this works is essentially that a VM is exposed as a library to the host uh, through a project called libcaron. And then um, you have a direct integration with Podman. So if you're familiar with Podman, you can download images that way and so on. And it, it's going to run relatively well. And that project got very early support uh, for SCV compared to the rest of the projects I'm talking about here. Um, in particular, they were the first to do uh, working remote attestation. So it's interesting that Confidential Containers as a project had defined a protocol, and we were not the first ones to implement the protocol The current VM project did. So for Confidential Containers, the next step in our use cases, uh, we essentially use Kata as a basis. So Kata was already running uh, workloads and containers in, uh, as, essentially, a virtual machine was a pod, and the Kata runtime will transmit 
the creation of containers, etc., so that it happens inside the virtual machine. So there was already some level of isolation from Kera itself, and continental containers, containers builds on that uh, to use the technologies that uh, the continental computing technologies. So these are the components that are impacted essentially. The next step up is, uh, as I mentioned, continental clusters. So one example of this is a project called Constellation by Edgeless. Um, so in that case, I cannot show it in real time. The real thing takes something like 40 minutes or something like that to bring up a cluster. But then you have a cluster that is completely, uh, um, that is essentially completely confidential, inclu including the control plane. And so you, you say, I want to start with, for instance, three worker nodes and two control nodes. And you have five confidential VMs that all authenticated each other. And uh, after that, it works mostly like a standard Kubernetes cluster. So you make again, the whole cluster confidential, and it works at the cloud provider level. So you, you start your session by saying, I am on Azure. I am on whatever and it, it does these things for you. So you can see what it looks like, and if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll probably recognize a few things here. And so what you see here is going inside this container and checking that SCV is active there, and uh, that's what you have inside. So um, one interesting aspect of this project is that they rely on something called attested TLS, and that's essentially a way of attesting the other side of a TLS transaction. So that's, that's interesting because it lets you build things that uh, span more than one containers. They also added something called a joint service, and that's uh, a way <coughs> to, add, when, when a new node wants to join the cluster, make sure that the new node itself is confidential. They also have this at the user level, a verification service that is user-facing and lets a user check before I deploy my workloads there, I want to make sure that the, the, the cluster is known to be confidential. So how do we build actual trust and keep the trust alive along the way? So how does attestation really work? You, you start, as I said, by, by doing some cryptographic measurement for instance, of your confidential VM or some enclave that you care about. This is done by hardware or firmware in a way that cannot be tampered with. That's the important part. And once this is done, you get some sort of reduced version, or some ID, some condensed version of hash or something like that, of that uh, measurement that you can send to the attestation service and that you can then compare with whatever is in, in your database of, um, uh, of identities. And if the attestation service is happy with it, it will typically request something from a key broker service or something like that and send you back the keys. That can be a decryption key for this. That can be whatever. Now, of course, the interesting point that, the, is that you can say no. And uh, when you can say no to something you said yes before. So that's another important aspect of remote attestation. So let's say you discover that this particular version of the Linux kernel has a flaw in it and can expose data. Then you can decide to, to exclude that now from your database and it will no longer boot, though it, did, it was accepted before. So the actual flow is slightly more complicated than what I just showed because the attester first does a request, but to avoid replay attacks and things like that, the relaying party typically responds with a cryptographic challenge with a nonce in it and so on. So you have to encrypt with that nonce and that makes sure you're not uh, responding with, by replaying something uh, or stale data. Uh, so then you present your evidence encrypted with uh, that nonce in it. Uh, the evidence is relayed to, to the verifier and the attestation result is then returned. And then if, the, if that passes the secrets, uh, are retrieved on, from the secret broker and sent back to the, the tester. So we have the same remit uh, flow there in terms of how this happens in practice. So I've tried to make it general because the name of these various components are different between AMD and Intel, but roughly it's the same process. So. Another interesting aspect of attestation is that 
different kinds of proof are needed for different kinds of consumers. What I mean with that is that, for instance, when you're booting the system, the thing that you care about is, is my uh, firmware and Linux kernel, are they the one I want? Are they not compromised? Are they versions that I trust? And so in that case, you're facing the system to try to build a trusted execution environment and make sure that it is trusted. User facing is you want to prove to some user of the system, hey, is the system actually safe? And of course, you have to, to, to have a way to trust that which the user can verify. So typically, that relies on uh, some endorser publishing their public key somewhere. And so you can validate with their public key that what you got was actually emitted by that endorser. We all know how this ends. Someday, the, the private key is leaked, and, and that whole process is invalidated. But at the moment, this is safe for the existing technologies. Another kind of attestation is workload facing, uh, checking if the runtime environment of a specific workload is, is valid. Peer facing is two workloads that want to check one another and make sure that they're not talking to the wrong guy and leaking through the other side. And cluster facing is essentially nodes who want to join a cluster and uh, they want to check that before I admit that node in the cluster, I want to check that it's actually running what I expect. Now, there are plenty of platform this specific details that I really uh, skimmed over. So the vendor landscape today for continuous computing looks roughly like this. You have uh, the AMD secure encrypted virtualization is sort of the first implementation of that that was really uh, widely available. Uh, this relies on a separate processor, essentially a small ARM core on the side, which will store all the really important stuff. And you have to go through that processor to do things like uh, getting a new key, getting uh, encryption activated, and so on. So that's AMD's approach, is having this separate core on the side that does this, this kind of things. Now, um, they had two later iterations. SCVES stands for encrypted state and adds encryption of the CPU register file, which otherwise in SCV um, the hypervisor could modify almost at will. And SCV and P SNP is a larger change. Uh, secure nested pages adds some integrated production and adds um, uh, uh, things like product interrupts, etc. The Intel equivalent is called Trust Domain Extensions, or TDX. And it's a very different approach because on that approach, it's essentially a new mode in the processor called SIEM, Secure Arbitration Mode. And so the processor goes to that mode where only Intel stuff runs when it needs to, to, to do something complicated. IBM does it completely differently with something called Secure Execution, which is firmware-based. Power has something called a Protected Execution Facility, which is a little closer to Intel than AMD implementation. And ARM has something called continuous computing architecture, which is like PEF or like Intel, based on having a layer below uh, that the operating system cannot touch. Now, what these technologies share is that they are all based on virtualization, but they all work dif differently. And so essentially, uh, you're fighting a bunch of random zombies when, when you want to. So AMD was the first one, and that was essentially the message child. Um, it was somewhat flawed. There was uh, memory encryption through hardware, which was good, but, uh, and it was built on top of, uh, of virtualization, unlike that other encryption technology called SME. As I said, it relies on a separate security processor and only features pre-attestation. Now, the problem is that several vulnerabilities were discovered relatively quickly that gave it a bad rep, which persists to this day. So the mop-up crew were SCV ES and SCV SNP. Uh, ES, as I said, products CPU stay from tampering. No major impact on attestation. SNP does have uh, protections against physical access to, to pages, uh, the hypervisor remapping and so on. But more importantly, you can get attestation data from within the guest. And so um, another interesting thing is something they call VMPL, which lets you build um, enclaves that are more privileged than others uh, to implement things like virtual TPMs, et cetera. 
So Intel TDX uh, relies on the SGX to create secure enclaves where they do a lot of the stuff. And it's virtualization based, but there is no separate security processor. And essentially, you use the secure arbitration mode to, to invoke services that are provided by SGX enclaves on the side. Uh, so various binary modules provided by Intel will expose the required services, and they have to be measured at boot and so on. So in particular, attestation is provided by a polling enclave. In terms of supporting technologies, well, uh, you need host and guest Linux kernel support, hypervisor support, guest firmware support, host provisioning for supporting tools like, for instance, uh, safe cuddle for starting a system. I'm going to show that later today. Generic key broker and, uh, uh, services and attestation. Compatibility layers to try to mimic what exists and uh, to be able to reuse the infrastructures that exist, like, for instance, a virtual TPM that mimics real TPMs. So this is provided by something called a uh, Secure Virtual Machine Service Module, or SVSM. So the blog details all this. So that's why I'm really skimming through. Uh, go in the blog, and you'll have pointers to the various documents and references, et cetera. So my conclusion is essentially that attestation means different things. Um, we, we really scratch only the surface. It's a large collection of technologies. Even in a given context, you can have attestation mean different things. So folks tend to, to talk past one another. You have to be careful about what you're talking about. Preserving the chain of trust correctly requires really careful thinking. And again, if you, uh, assist, you, you see my talk later today, you'll, you'll see a bit surprised there on what can go wrong. Technologies are not consistent across the board, so Intel and AMD do not think the same way. Again, you can take a picture of that if you want more details for the six-part blog series. Now it's time for questions. Sorry, I was a bit longer than I anticipated. So only two minutes, yeah. So I'll try to summarize the question for online, and you correct me if I summarize wrong. So the question is really about uh, what kind of hardware provides this, and how can I get that hardware, and how uh, can I go without it if, if I don't have the hardware? Is there an alternative that I can do in software? So for the first question, uh, these are typically new instances that get deployed as we speak. So for instance, there are new SCB SMP instances uh, on Azure that you can order. Uh, today, where they will have this pre-configured for you, and, um, and you go, in that case, through the attestation mechanisms provided by Azure. Uh, regarding whether you can implement that in software, you can mimic some of that in software to, uh, for development purpose. However, what the software cannot do for you is product from someone on the same machine being able to pick up the memory and uh, I'm going to, 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 to give examples. So the other talk, talk is at, I think, 5.15 uh, or something like that. And I'm going to show you how you can actually dump the memory of a VM and see what's inside and search for root passwords and stuff like that, and, and you find them. So like, is there any way uh, without like, hardware encryption? Let's say, I don't know what it would work, but let's say uh, a Java hardware uh, would be suitable for encrypting memory in flight. So, so the question is whether I could encrypt the memory on the, in, in flight. Um, encryption, by definition, has at some point uh, data in clear. That data today has to be stored in memory. And unless your whole message fits in registers, which let's say you have 16 registers on x86, on 64 bits, it's that, that's not a very long message. And plus, you, yeah, I, I'm out of time. But yeah, so the, the, the short answer is, I don't think so. I don't think you can do it safely, unless for very, very short messages. Uh, 